So close your eyes and ask the Lord this question. Lord, what am I afraid of? Maybe rejection, maybe illness, maybe death, maybe the devil. Jesus said there's only one to fear. Fear him who has the power to destroy both body and psyche and Gehenna. He was talking about his father. So there's only one to fear. A few verses later in Luke, he then says, so fear not. <laughs> The name of the one that you are to fear is love. And when you get a look, good look at him, a good look at him, revealed in Christ Jesus, perfect love casts out fear. So Lord God, would you fix our attention on you, cause us to believe your word, and help us to hope in the truth, no longer in lies, but the truth. Help us to preach in Jesus' name, Father. Amen. In uh, Acts chapter 1, Jesus... Uh, oh, by the way, Acts is also a continuation of the Gospel of Luke, if you didn't know that, which is important. But in Acts chapter 1, Jesus ascends to heaven. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit descends upon the church... Peter preaches, 3,000 people are baptized, there are signs and wonders. Perhaps the greatest sign and wonder is this. All who believed shared everything in common with glad and generous hearts. It's God's preferred form of government, free market communism. Acts chapter 3, Peter heals a lame man and preaches in the temple. Acts chapter 4, Peter and John are taken into custody by the Jewish authorities who then release them because they're afraid of all of the people that are just like praising uh, God in Jesus' name. In Acts chapter 4, verse 20 through 31, they all gather, uh, oh, I've, they all gather, they praise God because Peter and John have been released by the authorities. And then it's like Pentecost just happens all over again. They're filled with the Holy Spirit once again. Acts 4.32, we read this. Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. That's a miracle. But they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus, Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Barnabas shows up throughout the New Testament, never in the limelight, but always encouraging others, like he encouraged the Apostle Paul when everybody else was afraid to speak to the Apostle Paul. That happens in a few chapters in Acts. Like he encouraged the new Greek converts when others didn't want to include them in the life of the church. Like he encouraged his cousin Mark uh, when Paul wanted to leave Mark behind in Antioch. He really was, in other words, a, a, a parakletos in the Greek, an encourager or a conduit for the parakletos, who is the spirit of, of Jesus. But let me ask you, if someone did that here, if Barnabas did that here, let's say that one of you sold everything that they had, you, you came, you brought it at my feet, you gave it to the church, and, and, I, made a, and, I, and, I, and I pointed it out to you. Would that encourage you? or discourage you. You know, all this generosity in Acts chapter 2 through 4 is, is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Just like the gifts of tongues or prophecy or healing or administration 
or teaching and preaching the gospel. I still remember sitting in a car with the kindest and most encouraging man at Bel Air Presbyterian Church. I was the new high school youth director, and Irv Meridian was telling me about the old high school youth director, previous high school youth director. He paused for a moment, and they said, Oh, Peter, when Tim would preach, it was like he had a silver tongue. I remember that comment like a wound in my flesh. It encouraged me, it encouraged me to prove myself, to try and preach better than, than Tim. It encouraged my ego to assert itself. It encouraged my flesh and discouraged my spirit. Even though I knew Tim and was friends with Tim and already knew that he had a silver tongue. One day someone said, you preach as well as Tim. I acted like it didn't really matter. But I remember I ingested that comment like, like a drug. <laughs> About 10 years later, we were both senior pastors in the same denomination. At our annual national meetings, they would print church growth statistics in the docket. I acted like it just didn't matter. First moment I got when no one was looking, I'd check. If growth was less at Tim's church than my church, made me happy, sort of. For in a moment, I would also feel strangely afraid and alone. One year, Tim was in an accident regarding this weird incident with a train. He lost his leg. At the annual meeting, everybody honored Tim, and they, they brought him up front, you know, with his crutches and everything, and, and made a big deal about his ability to overcome the accident and keep on preaching Everyone uh, stood up, gave him a standing ovation. Years later, my old friend Johnny Patterson confided in me. He said, you know, Peter, after Tim came down from the podium at the General Assembly, he pulled me aside and he said, Johnny, I've never felt weaker in all my life. In other words, I've never been more discouraged isn't that something so encouraged and yet utterly discouraged? Johnny said, Tim, why don't, you, why don't you tell the leadership at your church? And Johnny said, Peter, Tim looked at me with this look of surprise and said, Johnny, I've seen what they do to the weak. They'll crucify me. I always wanted to be Tim. But I didn't really know him. Talked about Tim last, uh, last time in my sermon on suicide because it wasn't long after that, after that general assembly, that I got word that Tim had gone to the garage while his wife and his daughters were away, ran a tube from the exhaust of the car to the inside of the car, shut the car, turned the ignition, and asphyxiated himself, leaving behind his wife and his three little girls. In his suicide note... Uh, to the church, he wrote, is my own wretched weakness of which I am most ashamed. When I heard about Tim's suicide, something in me or around me, which I often think is me, that something thought, you won. Be happy. And then I felt strangely afraid and incredibly alone. So anyway, the believers were all together. There were signs and wonders. Church was growing like crazy. They shared everything in common with glad and generous hearts. That is, they shared everything because they wanted to. And Barnabas, son of encouragement, sold a piece of land and laid the proceeds at the apostles' feet. So if you would have been there, would you have been encouraged or discouraged? And would you then be motivated to imitate Barnabas? And if so, why? Verse 36, Barnabas, a, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. 
But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not as your disposal, at your disposal to, to do with what you wanted? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. That is why we'll always need an army. And may God strike me down were it to be other. Don't stand there, Corbin! Why, oh, you've never seen the hand of God before! Sorry. That may have been a bit abrupt. But I just couldn't help it. Don't stand there, Corbin, like you've never seen the hand of God before! You know, people always want manifestations of the Holy Spirit. You know this as a pastor. Uh, healings, prophecy, tongues. No one ever mentions this one. Verse 5. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men. Now this must have been like the youth group. Great youth group activity. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter, and now keep in mind that quite recently, Peter denied Jesus three times, right? Like only a month or two ago. And once, once upon a time, Peter looked at, at Jesus, and Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. So verse 9, but Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, look, the feet of those who have buried your husband, they're at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last, ex exuko in the Greek. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. So are you encouraged or discouraged? For decades now, particularly since I started to proclaim the biblical truth that as in Adam all die, so in Christ will all be made alive, particularly since then, people will say to me, but, but, what, but, but, but what about Ananias and Sapphira? If they're sympathetic to the gospel of relentless love, they'll often, they'll often find this story incredibly discouraging. And yet over the years, Honestly, I found it to be surprisingly encouraging. And I've had to ask myself, I've been asking myself this week, why is that? Well, um, we'll talk about that in a minute. But I've also been asking the question, why do people find it so discouraging? Here are a few ideas why we find it so discouraging. First, I think, I think we assume that God hated Ananias and Sapphira, right? And that he is now endlessly torturing them in a place called hell, which is really a Germanic word that isn't so much a biblical word. There's, there's no really biblical equivalent for what we normally mean by that. But you see, Scripture doesn't really allow for endless torture, for there's nothing that's truly endless except the end himself who fills all things and is just not interested in torture. And yet, apparently, God did kill them. Luke uses a rather interesting word that's only used in one other place in all of Scripture, and that's to describe what happens to King Herod when God kills King Herod in Acts chapter 12. The word is exuko. Ek is, ek is a prefix, meaning out or out of, and suko or psyche is normally translated as, as soul. So they outsold. And you remember that your soul was insold, or it was created when God breathed his breath, his spirit, into a bag of 
dust, and you became a, a living soul, suki. They, 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 they literally, Ananias and Sapphira, gave up the ghost, the spirit, the breath, the life, exuko. So yes, even if he didn't endlessly torture them, apparently God did kill them. And I suspect that that bothers most folks because most folks are antinomians or Marcionites. Marcion of Sinop was a second century theologian, so he lived about 100 years after Jesus. And he taught that Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, was a different God than the God and Father of our Lord Jesus the Christ. On the surface, it's an attractive idea, right? Bad Old Testament God, good New Testament God, but it's an absurd idea. For the name Jesus, Yeshua, means Yahweh is salvation. And Jesus, Paul, and all the New Testament authors are like constantly quoting the Old Testament. Antinomians teach that the Old Testament law has been abolished. Whereas Jesus taught that in him and through him it is always fulfilled. In other words, it's still not okay to bear false witness, to lie, number nine on, on the list. But in Christ and with Christ in you, you won't want to bear false witness. And so then telling the truth isn't simply a law, it has now become your nature. And you see, that doesn't mean that lies can exist in the presence of God, who is the truth, and the end of all lies, the presence of God, who violates all lies with himself, the truth. And I think that's another reason folks struggle with this story. They've been told that God is nonviolent. And I don't know, this seems kind of violent. I'm convinced that God takes no delight in pain. And he has no need to harm Jesus in order to feel better about you. And he has no need to harm you in order to feel better about you. Take vengeance on Jesus or vengeance on you to feel better about you. He already loves you absolutely thoroughly and completely with all he is and all that he has, and yet God will violate your will. And that should be rather obvious to you by now, if you're over the age of three or four. <laughs> he is the good will that violates our bad will. He doesn't torture Ananias and Sapphira, but he does get his way. And no matter how much you practice positive thinking, visualize success, or delve into health and wealth theology, you're going to die. People find it troubling that God would kill Ananias and Sapphira. But isn't it also troubling, when you think about it, that God did not kill Pontius Pilate? or Caiaphas, or Judas, or Herod, only a few months before? Why Ananias and Sapphira? Why not Hitler, or Vladimir Putin, or every rapist and murderer walking the face of the earth? I once prayed with a friend who had been tied to a bed, raped, and was about to be murdered by a man who went to plunge a knife into her chest, but he stopped at the last minute, freaked out, terrified, ran out of the room, and she always wondered why that happened. In a vision, Jesus showed my friend and my wife that he had been there all along. And when her abuser went to plunge the knife into her chest, he simply stuck out his hand. The knife hit his hand. The abuser freaked out and ran out of the room, and, and she began a, a new life. At first, I remember when we were having this experience, at first I thought, oh, how cool. And then I remember just getting really, really angry with Jesus. I thought, you have that power? I mean, we talked about it, but you actually have that power? Why didn't you stop him sooner? Why didn't you kill him the night before? Obvious question. But why stop there? I mean, why doesn't he just kill everyone that's ever listened to Satan? I mean, why did he let Noah get away on that boat 
It's a good question. Why didn't he kill you? Why didn't he kill me? Well, like I was saying, some people find this story to be incredibly discouraging, and yet I found it to be surprisingly encouraging. And so this week I have been asking myself, why? So here are a few conjectures as to why I find this to be a most encouraging, discouraging story. Number one, God does kill everybody. At least according to Moses in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 32, 39, 29, listen to this. See now that I, even I, am he. And there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. So God says through Moses, I kill. And how does he kill? Well, you got a Bible. In Genesis 18, it seems that the God-man that destroys Sodom is the one that brings the fire down upon Sodom. Sodom, and, and it seems to be the angel of Yahweh, the word of God in the pillar of fire that kills the Egyptians and even the Israelites in, in the wilderness. Jude 5 in the English Standard Version reads like this. Now, I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. People really struggle with that. In fact, some ancient manuscripts have the, the, the Lord, the, the name, the, or they print the Lord in place of the name Jesus, as if, you know, this kind of thing we kind of expect from Yahweh, but not from Jesus. And yet Jesus did say, if you want to be my disciple, you must pick up a what? A cross. Now, hopefully you know what those are all about, not just jewelry. And he said this, he said, you must lose your psyche, translated life sometimes. Revelation 14, I think it's pretty clear that Jesus, the angel of Yahweh, son of man, is the reaper. And he's not grim. Deuteronomy 3.29, I kill and I make alive. A few verses later, verse 42, I will make my arrows drunk with blood and my sword will devour flesh. In Revelation 19, it's so cool, John sees the Word of God, and he's already told us that the Word of God became flesh in his gospel, and uh, that his name is, is Jesus. A sword comes from the mouth of this Word of God riding a, a white horse, a sword, quote, with which to strike down the nations, and an angel standing in the sun calls to the birds, saying, come, gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, blah, 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 and all men. <laughs> He cuts the flesh from all men. Whatever the case, it does seem that God kills everybody. But murder is nobody. For God cannot murder. Murder is taking a life that is not your own. And the life, all life, is God's own. Jesus is literally the life. And according to Paul, the spirit is life. You become, you became a living soul the day God breathed his spirit, his breath, his life into your bag of dust. Solomon says the spirit returns to God who gave it. So whatever you think of all that, it seems that God kills everybody according to scripture. But that may not be as bad as you think because you're already dead. At least according to St. Paul in the New Testament. And it's right there in the second chapter of the Old Testament. God said to the Adam, to humanity, the day you eat of it, dying you will die. And then he put the Adam to sleep and he leaves the Adam, male and female, and utterly ignorant, leaves him alone with this tree and a talking snake. I kill and I make alive. God is not the snake. But he uses the snake. Romans 7, Paul writes, I was once alive apart from the law. I think we all have a faint memory of that. It comes from the time that we first became conscious of ourselves as separate from those around us. I, Peter, was once alive apart 
from the law, before I took the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and entered into this nightmare of trying to justify my own existence, which the Bible calls the work of the flesh. Do you ever feel like you need to justify your own existence? Do you ever feel like you need a reason to live? It occurred to me the other day that if I feel like I need a reason to live, I'm probably not living. Because Jesus is the life, and Jesus is the logos, Jesus is the reason, which is to say life is its own reason. So if I think I need a reason to live, I'm not living. I'm dead. And so when Jesus says, pick up your cross, pick up your tree, and come follow me, he's inviting us to die with him. When? We're already dead. It's the death of death, which is the second death, which is eternal life. The first death is like holding your breath. Your spirit, which is God's breath, as if it were simply your own. We hold it in this body of flesh. The problem with the flesh is not that it's physical, but that it's alone. It feels only its own pleasure and its own pain. The first death is imprisoning the breath of God that is the life of God in a psyche of self-centeredness and sin. The second death is losing that psyche. Exuki. Exuko is giving up the ghost. That is the, the spirit. It's expiring so that you can be inspired. It's learning to breathe the spirit of God who is the life, the life of Christ, the life of God, and your life, your eternal life. And so Jesus said, whoever would save his psyche will lose it, but whoever would lose his psyche for me will find it. The book of Hebrews tells us that God took on flesh, that, quote from chapter 2, that through death, through death, he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those, all those, who through fear of death were subject to lifelong bondage. You see, Satan can't kill you. He can only make you afraid to die when you're already dead. He makes you too terrified to breathe. 2 Timothy 1.10, Christ Jesus abolished death. And how did he do that? By causing all of us to expire and inspire to breathe. So whatever the case, whatever you think of that, God does say in Deuteronomy, I kill and I make alive. And I find that to just be incredibly good news. People get so worked up that God might kill somebody as if they're utterly in a way that God kills everybody. And that to live with Jesus, you must die with Jesus. We're all going to die. I mean, whenever I talk about this, people look concerned. And I'm like, we already knew that, right? We're all, we're all going to die. But who do you want to be in charge of that process? The devil? Chance? Cancer? Vladimir Putin's bad choices? Your bad choices? You know, God is none of those things, and yet God uses all of those things to bring us to the end of our own old, miserable, lonely selves. I had a weird and wonderful couple of months. On June 1st, my father-in-law was barely breathing. He was not a religious man. But I put my face right next to his face and I I whispered in his ear. Never been this close to my father-in-law before. I said, Dad, look for the way. Look for the shepherd. Do what the shepherd tells you. And then I just began to recite the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. He leads me in paths of righteousness. He leads me in the right paths. 
even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you're with me. And I will return to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When I finished my prayer, I looked down and I, I thought, he's not there. The nurse came in and said, yeah, he's gone. I think he went with the shepherd. On July 29th, a few weeks later, I decided to visit my old friend Wade, who'd been on our prayer team and had blessed me immensely with his prophetic gifts and his prayers over the years, for years and years, but who had now been slowly drinking himself to death. He was in hospice, and he looked like death. I mean, his body was just utterly emaciated. His eyes kind of rolled back in his head his breath smelled like death and all he could do was moan we were alone in the room together I, I bent down and I just I told him Wade you're forgiven his son told me that he had been afraid to die and, and then I prayed the 23rd Psalm even though I walked through the valley of the shadow and I remember that Wade suddenly got really animated, but, but I couldn't make out any words. I, I finished the psalm and the prayer and then said, wait, I'm going to sit down here and go over my sermon notes. This was two weeks ago on, on Saturday. And then I looked again at Wade a few times and I thought, he's not here. He's gone. And the nurse came in once again and said, yep, he's gone. I think he waited for me to help him entrust himself to the shepherd, and I really believe that he went with the shepherd, who is also the reaper, who uh, is the relentless lover of Wade's soul, and so he caught that emaciated flesh with all its addicted desires from Wade's spirit and his new soul, and Wade began to breathe the life, the spirit of the age to come. God kills everybody. It is appointed once for man to die, says the book of Hebrews. God kills everybody, and, and so did God kill Tim. Like I said last time, Tim tried to kill Tim, and it didn't work. Suicide doesn't work. It's not the death of death. It's just more death. Tim didn't kill Tim. I suspect he just trapped himself deeper in death for a time. And I genuinely hope that that time was just a moment. But if not, Jesus is there with him. And he will die with him. And he will rise with him. Or he has already done so. Tim can't kill Tim. But God kills Tim. And God makes him alive. I'm convinced that's also true of Ananias and Sapphira. People get so worked up that God would kill somebody. But I think it's incredibly good news that God kills everybody. So that was number one. God kills everybody. This is number two. God saves everybody. Zephaniah 3 verse 8. My decision, mishpat in Hebrew, my judgment is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out upon them my indignation, all my burning anger. For in the fire of my jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. For at that time, I will change the speech of the people to a pure speech, that all of them may call upon the name of Yahweh and serve him with one accord. In other words, I kill and I make alive forever, without end for life. The life is the end. God saves us from the devil. He saves us from all the lies. He saves us from each other. He was saving the infant church from Ananias and Sapphira. And perhaps most of all, he saves us from ourselves. For we are each our own deepest prison. The chief punishment of the liar is not so much that he is no longer believed, but that he can no longer believe. Ananias and Sapphira had each trapped themselves alone in their own unbelief. But Jesus saves our true selves 
from our false selves, our arrogant egos. Number three, God disciplines everyone, everybody. He violates, listen closely, he violates your bad will with his good will in order to give you a free will. He violates your bad will with his good will in order to give you a free will. That's what every parent does when they discipline, every good parent, when they discipline their children. He violates your bad will with his good will in order to give you a free will. As, as I've told you, God once pinned me to the ground, literally. And I sincerely thought that he was going to kill me. And I, and I was aware at the time, I remember, that if I asked him to, that he would stop. But I didn't ask him to because it was the most ecstatically pleasurable and wonderful experience of my life. He was freeing me from me. At one point, I thought he was going to break my arms, and I'd always pray, God, if I'm out of your will, just break my arms. And, and weirdly, or maybe not weirdly, that has been the greatest comfort to me over the last 30 years. The idea, the knowledge that, well, God can deal with me. And that's number four. God hates pomposity. My old religious me. So, why did God kill Ananias and Sapphira? You see, I think we're all supposed to be a little bit shocked by the story of Ananias and Sapphira because we're all Ananias and Sapphira. We all dress up for church. I mean, why did you wear clothes to church today? It's summer. You didn't know that? Thanks for doing so, by the way. I want you to keep doing that. But why did you do that? We do have a need to protect each other from sexual sins. But even deeper than that, don't we want to cover our insecurities? Our weaknesses? The ever-increasing evidence that, yes, we are dying? We all ate. And we're all dying. Adam and Eve covered themselves with fig leaves and lies, self-righteous lies. They faked righteousness. They faked a manifestation of the Spirit. All righteousness is the Spirit of Jesus, according to Paul. You know, back when I was popular and my church was growing as fast as Tim's church, I was invited to appear on a local uh, Christian television show and I remember the perky interviewer sitting on the couch with the boat behind him he turned to me and he said this he said so brother Peter what do you think when a wonderful young new couple walks through the doors of your young and thriving church immediately I pictured a couple from the week before and I knew exactly what I thought as if God himself was reminding me I didn't notice him. I noticed her. And I so clearly remember thinking, dang, she's hot. <laughs> totally hot. But, but I looked at the interview and I said something like, um, well, uh, you know, um, I, I, I think God has a wonderful plan for that lovely young couple. <laughs> That's pomposity. That's a self-righteous lie. That's what we all do all the time. That's how you grow a false self, an imitation Christ, who you think is going to save you, but it's not. That's, that's the prison in which we all find ourselves scared and alone. So I'm glad that God hates that. For I hate that, for that is my own evil taskmaster, my constant drive to justify my own existence because I do not truly believe that I am justified by the grace of God. That I am the creation of God. That's pomposity. And that's how Satan divides the body of Christ. That's how he tempts an insecure guy like me to compete with an insecure guy like Tim and actually think that he's won because his brother has lost, when in fact he, Peter, has just lost touch with the kingdom of God. 
In Acts chapter 2 through 4, the kingdom of God was manifesting on earth. People loved because they actually wanted to love because God is love. In Acts chapter 5, Satan tempted members of the church to fake love in the hope of possessing more love when God is love and absolutely, relentlessly, furiously free. Peter says to Ananias and Sapphira, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? I highly doubt that Peter is clueless as to the answer to that question. Just recently, he had his own struggles with sin and Satan. I suspect he knows the answer, but he's inviting Ananias and Sapphira and all of us to wrestle with this question. Why do we lie to the Holy, Holy Spirit? I mean, to each other, but even to the Holy Spirit, in an effort to exalt ourselves rather than humble ourselves. I think there are obvious answers to that question, and, and maybe one or two not, not so much. For, for, one, for one, we don't really believe that God is all-knowing. And so he knows each one of us better than we know ourselves. He does not know the lie, right, because it does not exist, actually, but he knows you. He knows the real you. For another, we don't really believe that God is all-powerful. And so that God is the one that does everything that's anything. So every heartbeat is a gift. Every good deed is a gift. Every good thought, every good desire is also a gift. And most of all, we don't really believe that God is all-love. And so genuinely likes us. As we are. In any given moment. Number four, God hates pomposity because number five, he genuinely likes you. He adores you. God hates that false self that Ananias and Sapphira presented to the church because God just adores Ananias and Sapphira, his children. My son Coleman was home last week. He, he just earned his doctorate in geology. Kid's like a genius. But I still have videos of Coleman eating toothpaste. Well, Susan says, Coleman, are you eating toothpaste? He says, no, Mommy, I'm not eating toothpaste. I remember him with dirt caked all around his lips, looking at me with those big eyes. As I say to Coleman, have you been eating dirt? No, Daddy, I haven't been eating dirt. I'd force myself to get mad at him. And yet I just, I just adored him. I did not adore the lies but I adored the one that spoke the lies because he longed for my approval at any given moment. When he was in junior high, our church fell apart. I knew he had to be hurting, but I was pretty occupied with my own pain. Knife marks started showing up in the, in the drywall in our newly finished basement. There was really only one explanation. So I asked Coleman several times. I said, Coleman, have you and your friends been throwing knives at the wall? Every time. No, Dad. No, don't know what you're talking about. I absolutely hated it. That junior high male pomposity. By, deni by de denying it, you see, he was denying me of knowing him. I absolutely hated that false Coleman because I so thoroughly love Coleman, the real Coleman, who longs for love just like I long for love. A few years later, his life fell apart. And one night, he fell apart. I just ached for him. And yet I was thrilled with him, for once again I found him, and he found me. Not in our strengths, but in our weaknesses. Colin, I'm so sorry that I wasn't there for you. And Dad, I'm sorry that I didn't tell you it was me and Jacob. I don't know what I was thinking. I don't know why I'd lie to you. See, I'm glad he got his doctorate. 
But I do not know that I could love him any more than I already do. For long ago, I fell in love with the little boy hiding in the corner eating toothpaste. And I loved him with all that I am and all that, that, I've, that I've got. I, I hate the hiding precisely because I adore the little boy that hides. I love him. And so I just long to be with him, the, the real him. I see myself in him. Did you know that God sees himself in you? That's why he gets so mad when you cover yourself with fig leaves and lies. He hates the pompous way that you cover your weaknesses, for it's in your weaknesses that he reveals the glory of his strength. And his strength is not what we would call power. It's his relentless love. It's the power to lay power down. It's mercy. He consigned all men to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. In his suicide note, Tim wrote, it is my own wretched weakness of which I'm most ashamed. In 2 Corinthians, Paul wrote, I will all the more gladly boast of my weaknesses that the power of Christ might rest upon me. I wish I could have been there that night that Tim ran the hose and turned the key because I think I might have been able to encourage him. I wouldn't have encouraged him by showing him the church growth charts or saying, Tim, wow, you totally deserve the preaching award, and I didn't. I think I would have encouraged him by saying, Tim, I'm just like you. I'm lonely and terrified, too. I think that's what I find most encouraging about Barnabas. Later in Acts, he and Paul get in a fight about Mark, his cousin. Just, you know, flesh. And yet God brings those guys back together, and through them he changes the world. I find that highly encouraging. You know, a body, a body is joined at a point of weakness in each and every member. It is joined in weakness, which is its strength. So I wish I'd been there for Tim, and, and yet maybe in some amazing way, I am there for Tim. And for Ananias and Sapphira, and Peter, and Paul, and Mark, and Barnabas, and Judas, and they are forever there for me. I mean, maybe heaven is everyone boasting in their weaknesses and glorying in God's strength. So anyway, heaven was manifesting on earth, in this age, in Acts chapter 4. And for a moment, God protected it from the cancer that is the arrogant human ego. It is really discouraging to my flesh that I cannot make heaven happen. And it is really encouraging to my spirit that heaven is heaven and God is making it happen. That's number six. God hates Pomposity because he absolutely adores you. And, and six, God is all about the party. An endless party called the kingdom of, of God, the kingdom of heaven. If you know anything about great parties, you know that a bunch of people trying to exalt themselves is not heaven. That's hell. And yet a bunch of people humbling themselves to exalt one another, oh, that's not hell. That's heaven. And so on the night that he was betrayed, the highly exalted one took bread and broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. And in the same manner, after supper and having given thanks, he took the cup and he said, this is the covenant in my blood. The life is in the blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. You know, if I was Peter, and I, and I am Peter, by the way, but I mean, if I was that Peter, and Ananias and Sapphira bought a bunch of money to me, I wouldn't even ask questions. I'd be like, oh, thank you so much, and we're going to put a plaque in the back of this sanctuary for you, and we're going to have a special pew and a drinking fountain with your name on it. I would have taken the money. But apparently Peter, or the spirit in Peter, didn't really care about the money. The Spirit just wanted Ananias and Sapphira to be real. 
To come to this table isn't to vow anything, promise anything, or pay anything. It is to simply confess everything. It's to say, so this is what you're saying if you're coming to the table. I want to love, but I don't love. I want to give all I have, but I also don't want to give all I have. I want to love love, but I don't love love. So would you help me love, love, love? God looks past the toothpaste. Pat looks past the dirt on your lips, the knife marks in the wall in the basement, the church building projects, all the fancy sermons, the fig leaves and the fear. And he says, of course. Been waiting a long time for you to ask for that. You're my body. And this is our blood. Amen. So close your eyes and ask God again, Lord, uh, what am I afraid of? Uh, rejection? Death? Losing myself? And Jesus says, listen, there's only one you need to fear, and that's your Father in heaven who can destroy both body and soul in Gehenna. And so look at him. Fear only him. Look at him. And what does he say to you? Huh. I'm Jesus. Jesus is the revelation of my heart. I'm perfect love. You, you just said to me, if more of you means less of me, take everything. Thanks for saying that. But you see, uh, more of me doesn't actually mean less of you. Not the real you. Only the lies that you've been telling yourself about yourself. But the more of me means the more of you. For you are my beloved. And I long to fill you with myself. And I'm not less. I'm always more. So believe the gospel. And now, sweetheart, no more fear. No more fear. We're through with fear. Amen.